Hey, I think it's time to try starting the engine on the Honda CX500. Welcome to Urban Monk TV. Okay, so I think what I'd like to do is start the engine on my Honda CX500 here and uh, see if it's going to run, see if the new stator that we installed uh, is indeed going to um, put out a nice charge and that our new regulator rectifier is working. Um, but first, before I do that, I want to say real briefly a thank you to everyone who has purchased my book, Creating Mr. Corton. Uh, the sales of this book have exceeded my expectations. And so if you have purchased the book and have read it, some of you have reached out to me and said that you have. Uh, thank you. I really do appreciate that. So if you haven't, uh, it's available on urbanmonktv.com or on Amazon. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. So, what do I got to do to get this thing running? Um, the engine's in. I need a battery. Uh, I don't have a battery that is a perfect fit for this thing, but I've got a, a motorcycle battery around that we can wire in and, and get power to it. And I've also got a jumper battery, so I'll use that. And uh, I got to put in coolant and oil, uh, put the spark plugs back in, and we need fuel. Those of you who are familiar with uh, my GS550 build, or Mr. Corton as I'm fond of calling him now, uh, may recall me balancing the gas tank from that motorcycle on a ladder to do a, you know, running the engine and, and a, a tuning carbs and just test starting the bike. Um, I'm really excited to try this Alpha Moto auxiliary gas tank for working in the shop. It's got a really nice valve on it and uh, a lid so if this thing falls it's not going to spill gas all over the place and uh, become a fire hazard which frankly the way I was doing things before I'm either risking a fire and a, and a really big problem or I'm risking dropping a vintage gas tank which is not easily replaced and damaging it. So with this, um, it's not an expensive thing. In fact, I'll, I've got a link below in the description. Uh, they've offered me a discount that I can extend to you uh, with a code and uh, the UMTV. And uh, you can go to Alpha Moto and get yourself one of these. So hey, let's get going. So we got to fill the engine with coolant. Get the cap off. Now any coolant that is rated for aluminum engines is fine. You don't have to buy something special for motorcycles in my opinion. I never have. I've just always made sure that it was okay for aluminum engines. And with motorcycles, you definitely need to pay attention to that one piece. And so what is the point of coolant? When we call it antifreeze, that's one purpose. But it's not just about keeping an engine from freezing, you know, in storage over the winter. Yep, yeah, I guess I found full. Um, it also raises the boiling temperature so that the coolant is less likely to boil um, because water is going to boil at US uh, 220 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 Celsius of course but with antifreeze or coolant added to it uh, then that liquid can go higher than that without boiling. The other thing that's helping uh, hold off or stave off that boiling is your radiator cap. 
When a liquid is under pressure, then it is also less likely to boil, or not even less likely, it's just absolutely not going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius or 220 Fahrenheit. It's going to have to be hotter before it boils. So the radiator caps are set with a certain number of PSI or bars that uh, before the spring will release the pressure. So, you know, typically it's like 15 PSI or something. So in combination with the coolant additive to regular water and pressure, that's why engines can run higher than boiling temperature without actually boiling the coolant. A little science lesson. I'm going to need some spark plugs and uh, D8EANGK is what we need. The tricky thing here is that most spark plug uh, sockets are too wide in diameter to fit down in this hole and so the tool that comes in the tool kit with the CX500 is what you need to get spark plugs in and out of this thing. I didn't get a tool kit with this bike and uh, not sure what happened to it, but thankfully uh, my buddy Rodney, who many of you are familiar with from my videos, uh, had this one laying around. It's actually intended for a BMW airhead, but uh, or maybe it's for a K. I don't remember, but anyways. And just be careful that you're not dropping it in there so that it lands on the uh, electrode and closes the gap. In fact, what I'm going to do is just gently put it down in there with a needle nose pliers. The other thing that helps is uh, ensuring that I don't get some of the crud that's down in there inside of the cylinder. Kind of helps to have one that's ratcheting, but not entirely necessary. Same thing on the other side. And you want to feel that compression washer compress. There is a torque spec for those, but I've always just done it by feel. And another thing we need is some lubricating oil for the uh, engine, of course. If you like motorcycles, custom builds, or just like a good story about a man's three-year effort to build a tribute to his childhood teacher, get a copy of Creating Mr. Corton. In it, you'll learn how this man changed this man for the better. How this man took this and built this. How these guys became lifelong friends and enthusiasts of motorcycling and craftsmanship. And how the name Urban Monk originated. It's available from Amazon anywhere in the world that Amazon ships in both paperback and ebook, or you can purchase through a link found on urbanmonktv.com. Get your copy of Creating Mr. Corton today. I, um, I talk a lot about this oil. It's uh, intended for diesel engines, but it is Jasso MA2 certified. Uh, there it is right there. And it's got a high zinc content. These old vintage bikes really like it. Um, and I also run it in my V-Strom exclusively, which, you know, people can say, well, that's not motorcycle oil, but I show on video just how much, uh, well, one, I've got over 70,000 miles on my V-Strom and I've run this oil exclusively, um, but I also tear my engine apart and get into how much the valve tappets have, uh, worn and what my engine compression is and this oil is treating that engine really well you know maybe you want to argue that Suzuki built that engine so well that that's why 
Um, I don't know. I think it might be a combination of both Suzuki making a really good engine and um, you know an oil that's working. I do change the oil frequently. Okay, I need a battery and I don't have one that fits uh, as a direct fit. This one, the polarity is in the wrong direction, but I can just turn it around and I'll strap it in here. Um, it's a decent battery. I don't know that it's a hundred percent. I may not get an accurate picture of what my voltage regulator and rectifier is doing until I get a squared away solid battery. But clearly this isn't rocket surgery. I need to go positive to positive and negative to negative. Got my trusty hardware Hank keychain which is pretty cool, although I'll probably replace it with an RM stator keychain. Okay, good sign. Power. High beam, no. Yeah, I don't have a headlight. That's interesting. Since we have questionable battery here, I'm just going to bring in more power to be sure that uh, I don't want to be grounded out anywhere. Airbox is plastic, so that's okay. So now I've got really two batteries. Okay, so I've got this extra auxiliary battery there and uh, powered it back up. My headlight is obviously either disconnected or bad, but I do have running lights front and back. Hello, Mr. Corton. And uh, so we got lots of power. Last thing we need, we have spark, we got power, we got coolant. We need fuel. All right, time for a little go go juice. And uh, this Alpha Moto auxiliary tank is going to make this really easy. I have the valve turned off. By the way, none of this is a recommendation directly from Alpha Moto or the manufacturer of this, um, this tank. This is just how I'm doing it. It's for entertainment purposes only. But I really like this thing compared to what I was doing before. because the lid is on there pretty tight. I mean, I don't want to go turning this upside down and testing that this is fuel tight, but if it does fall, there's something there. Um, you know, you can get to it quickly. Now, where to hang these things up? You know, if I'm about right here, this is about the height of the fuel outlet on the actual tank. So I really don't need to be any higher than this. Um, of course, I don't really have a good spot to hang this. So if I had a ladder or something I could hook this to, um, that would be fine. I'm going to go ahead and hang it from my ceiling uh, to one of the brackets on my garage door opener. But the thing there is that then the weight of my fuel gets to be uh, significant and that pressure of that weight of the liquid is pushing down on my needle valves inside of my float bowls. So I don't want to have too much pressure there. Um, so one of the things I'm going to do is I'm not going to fill this thing all the way because of course the weight of all of that gas is going to be pressing on it too. So don't fill this thing up. Just put in a little bit of gas. So I hung it up there. Um, again not a recommendation. This is what I'm doing, entertainment purposes only. And the other thing I added in here was a clear fuel filter so that I can actually see the gas flowing. I just think that's helpful um, for me to have some kind of visual that the, the fuel is 
actually going in. Um, so I'm ready to turn this valve. I'm not going to open the valve all the way. Uh, that way I can s throttle this fuel some. But that's all you need is just a trickle like that. And now I'm going to be looking in my bowls below for leaks. So I have got a fuel leak up there where the fuel rail connects into the number one carburetor. Um, I'm going to have to address that. But for now, I probably have got fuel in that float bowl and this one also. So let's see if we can start it. Okay, I opened up the garage door for ventilation in case I do get it running here. And uh, when I've got a fuel leak and I'm starting up a bike, things are going to get a little hot. You never know if maybe you're going to get a spark from somewhere. Uh, just to be safe, thankfully I've never had to use it, but I do keep a fire extinguisher close by. And make sure it's a type that will actually extinguish a fuel fire. Um, really do not expect to be uh, having to use it here. But So I've got gas and float bowls. And uh, what else? I guess that's it. We have spark. We have coolant. We have engine oil. I'm going to see if we have a starter that turns over. We do not. Oh, yeah, we do. Ooh, we do not have a lot of power here. That's our issue. Hmm. Okay, pretty much determined that I've got a bad battery here, so I'm not getting enough power to it. And then the jumper battery, uh, I went and looked at the state of charge on that, and it's not charged, so it wasn't helping any. Uh, so what I'm going to do is let that thing charge, and we'll take another stab at this later. In the meantime, I'm also putting a 2 amp 12 volt charger on this battery, but um, I think I really just probably should go get a new battery. Uh, I don't want to teach that a person should sit here and struggle with a dead battery for very long. Because frankly, you can't run a motorcycle on a dead battery. So um, I think I just need to go get one. So I bought a new battery. This is a wet cell, a little bit cheaper. And so I need to fill this up with the uh, acid and water solution that comes in the box. And I need to um, charge it some. Okay, so I've been charging uh, this new battery now for, uh, I'm going to guess about 10 hours at 2 amps, something like that. And uh, I'm going to try to turn the engine over again, oopsie, and um, I know that my initial start is likely to be a difficult one, so I'm going to kind of subsidize power here for lack of a better term, um, with a backup battery or a portable, you know, extra battery here. So that puts a lot more power in. And I'm just using these clamps because it helps things fit. These are kind of bulky for a small motorcycle battery. And uh, let's try turning this thing over and just see what it sounds like now. The other thing I can say is, uh, the initial fuel leak on that fuel rail <clears throat> has gone away and I've seen that before with these carbs on the CB900 that I did uh, and restored. Um, the seals, they, they get thicker and, and I don't know, re-wetted I guess is a way to say it and they expand and seal better once they've got some gas on them. After they've been sitting on the bench a while they dry out. 
Oh, that was a fire there. Okay. Let's give it another shot. I'm not smelling fuel. So again, just giving my battery a chance to uh, recover here between attempts and cool the starter. Uh, but we had one little sputter there from one of the cylinders. If I had to guess, it sounded like it was coming off a of number one, but uh, it's a guess. So, um, you know, that's promising. Just one fire is hope. <laughs> I'm gonna get more power. Okay, I just added a pair of jumper cables coming from my car, which is off camera here. Uh, but now I've got the backup battery up here, and of course the new motorcycle battery and a uh, car battery all hooked up, so I should have ample power here. Well, it's turning pretty well. Now I need fuel, clearly. I should be smelling gas, and I'm not. Let's pull out the spark plugs and see if they're getting wet. It is wet. But barely. It's wet. Yeah, there's fuel there. I have fuel going into the fuel line, but there is also this vacuum line that goes to the fuel petcock that normally, you know, is not then bleeding air into that passageway. So I've really got a vacuum leak as long as this is open. This other one is just a drain tube. But I'm going to plug this off, and that's the plug I'm using. And hopefully I'll get a little bit more suction on that uh, number two cylinder. On, on. Oh, there was one. <laughs> Jeez. Hell of a backfire. Well, I'm getting a few sputs and sputters after that backfire, but holy moly. I keep pausing the video to give the battery a little chance to recover. Um, my ear's ringing. Little battery care. So I'm going to keep at this. Disconnect the car. Okay, so now it's officially running on its own electrical system with no uh, supplementation, let's say. Okay, so I'm back to charging the battery while I figure out why I got fuel starved. Because I really shouldn't have. I've got plenty of fuel being delivered right now. This is open. <laughs> it's always fun though when they start, you know, because if it started once, it'll start again. We'll figure it out. The engine is a little warm right now, 
So I took the choke off. And my starter is warm for sure. Gotta lay off. Um, kind of running out of time here this morning. My bad, I had the fuel valve on this uh, auxiliary fuel tank on the off position, so of course it became fuel starved. So let's open that up again and try this again without choke. Yeah, it's happier. Maybe a little choke? so you can hear me talk. So the Honda CX500 leased this particular model uh, and this is different between GL 500s and some of the CX's from different years and I think, but don't quote me on this, um, different regions of the world where they distributed this bike, they had different electrical systems and this is a particular model that the engine will run separate from the battery and the charging system and so you know essentially you've got a magneto that's providing spark uh, and you can ride this bike with a dead battery if you can get it started um, so when I rev up the RPMs on like Mr. Corton my old Suzuki um, you'll see the voltage come up and peak out at like 14 and a half volts and that's the voltage regulator kicking in and holding you know a, a ceiling on how much voltage comes from the stator in the engine uh, to charge a battery and doesn't overcook it but on this bike increasing the RPMs uh, doesn't necessarily mean an increase to um, voltage at the battery and we've got a new RM stator voltage regulator in there which is you know much newer technology than what originally came on these bikes so the fact that it was maintaining 12.3 yet to be determined whether that's just the base level power coming off the battery or if it is indeed charging I'm gonna answer that in a future video um, and I also wanted to point out that this Alpha Moto auxiliary fuel tank, when operated by somebody that's paying attention to what they're doing, which is clearly not me, uh, because I had the valve off and I'm starving my engine of fuel, um, it works great. It's so much handier than having uh, the vintage tank from the bike hanging on a ladder precariously or, or something to that effect. So. I like it. Just remember that if you have a bike where there is a vacuum petcock uh, that's regulating flow from the stock tank, that if you're using this um, auxiliary fuel tank, you do need to concern yourself with that vacuum leak then that's created by not having the petcock in place. Once we put the tank back on, clearly all of this will be hooked up. The auxiliary tank will not be a part of the equation, and you know that will be back to normal. But this is not normal this is the shop experience so kudos to the Alpha Moto um, auxiliary fuel tank if you want to get yourself one uh, use the coupon code in the description below 
or you'll find it on a link on my website, urbanmonktv.com. And if you like wrenching on motorcycles or just reading a story about uh, a young man falling in love with motorcycling and this particular model of motorcycle uh, back in the 70s and 80s in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, check out my book, Creating Mr. Corton. And I have an announcement coming up on Mr. Corton. Uh, stay tuned for that. So. Uh, this can be found on urbanmonktv.com also or on Amazon and it ships anywhere in the world that Amazon will ship. If you like this video and you want to be updated of uh, future videos, especially the big announcement I have coming up for the channel, please click that like button and subscribe if you want to become an urban monk. Thanks for watching.